Chapter 10, Transcription and Translation. So we've been talking about the genetics um, of, the, of, of eukaryotic cells specifically. Um, we mentioned a little bit about prokaryotic cells in Chapter 8 when we talked about binary fission, but we're going to focus more on the eukaryotic um, viewpoint in the next couple of chapters. Now, in Chapter 10, we're continuing on with genetics, but in a little different way. In Chapter 8, we talked about mitosis and meiosis. In Chapter 9, we talked about Punnett squares and dominant recessive genes. In Chapter 10, we're going to continue to talk about genes, and DNA specifically we're going to talk about, and how DNA relates not just to heredity, but also to creating protein in the body. So viruses provided some of the earliest evidence that our genes are made up of DNA. And in molecular biology, we have, we have shown that DNA serves as the basis of heredity or inheritance. So we're going to start by reminding ourselves what DNA is. And we did mention this very briefly in Chapter 3, but DNA is a nucleic acid. And in chapter 3, we talked about the four groups of organic molecules. We started with carbohydrates, we looked at lipids, we looked at proteins, and we also looked at, nit at nucleic acids. And the nucleic acids include DNA and RNA. DNA and RNA. So we're going to remind ourselves about the basics of DNA and RNA and then talk about how they help us to make protein. DNA is a nucleic acid made of long chains of nucleotides. So when we looked at carbohydrates, we saw that carbohydrates were made up of monosaccharides or little sugars. We looked at how proteins were made up of amino acids. And now we're looking at how DNA is made up of what are called nucleotides. Now I want to mention one other thing to you as we start going through this chapter. All of these slides have been provided to you in your outline packet, but also if any of these pictures are hard to see, a little fuzzy or blurry, remember that they all came from your textbook. So if you need to have your textbook out as you go through this chapter, be sure that you have it nearby so that you can compare the pictures if they're a little bit hard for you to see. <clears throat> okay, so DNA, nucleic acid. We also should remember that DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Deoxyribonucleic acid. And DNA is usually described as being made up of a sugar phosphate backbone. DNA is made up of a sugar phosphate backbone. And the sugar specifically in question here is deoxyribose. That's the sugar, deoxyribose. So we have a sugar phosphate backbone, the sugar being made out of deoxyribose. And we also have, helping to make up DNA, what are called nitrogenous bases. The nitrogenous bases of DNA are these. DNA has four kinds of nitrogenous bases that are abbreviated as A, T, C, and G. The A stands for adenine. The T stands for thymine, the C stands for cytosine, and the G stands for guanine. So it would be a good idea to take a minute and jot these four nitrogenous bases down. These four, along with a sugar phosphate backbone, make up DNA, or deoxyribonucleic acid, which holds the key to your genes, it holds your heredity, and it also is going to help us to make protein. RNA is our second type of nucleic acid, and it has a little bit different of a sugar. RNA has the sugar called ribose. It's still made up of a sugar phosphate backbone, but the sugar is ribose, and it too has nitrogenous bases. And the nitrogenous bases are identical to DNA except for one. We still have the A for adenine. We still have the G for guanine. We still have the C for cytosine. 
but instead of T, we have U, which stands for uracil, and that's how uracil is spelled. So the same nitrogenous basis for RNA, except we substitute uracil, or U. So reviewing before we go any further, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, made up of a sugar phosphate backbone, the sugar being deoxyribose, and the nitrogenous bases being adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. RNA is also a nucleic acid, and it stands for ribonucleic acid, and it is made up of a sugar phosphate backbone as well. And the sugar phosphate, or the sugar in this sugar phosphate backbone is ribose instead of deoxyribose. It too has nitrogenous bases, and they are the same except for the T, which is substituted for U, uracil. James Watson and Francis Crick were the scientists who worked out the 3D structure of DNA. So they determined what DNA looked like. And they did this by using work that was originally started by Rosalind Franklin, who began the DNA research. And through Watson and Crick and Rosalind Franklin's research, we determined that DNA is what we call a double helix shape, which sort of looks like a ladder that has been twisted up into a coil, into a helix. Okay, so that's why we call it a double helix, because it's two strands that are twisted together to make what we call a double helix. So adding to your list of DNA um, facts, we also have that it's shaped like a double helix. RNA, on the other hand, does not have the same shape. RNA is what we call single-stranded, single-stranded. So it looks like half of this ladder, okay? There's no twist, there's no helix, it just looks like half of this ladder, single-stranded. Now if we go back to focusing on DNA for a minute, DNA, those nitrogenous bases that we talked about, A, T, C, and G, those bases pair up in couples, okay? The A, likes to hang out or bond with the T, and the G likes to hang out or bond with the C, okay? So we're always gonna find A and T bound together and G and C bound together. We should never see A and C bound and we should never see G and T bound, okay? So A always binds with T and G always binds with C. And this is something you're also going to want to make note of because it is very important that we know what nitrogenous base binds with the other. There are three representations of DNA shown in your textbook. Uh, the first representation is, is my personal favorite because we can see a little bit more of the detail there. This is a chemical structure representation, and this is a computer model, and we can see that three-dimensional helical uh, shape. But this one's called a ribbon model, and this one I like the most because we can see some of the main points we've talked about related to what DNA should look like. So in this picture here, we can see that DNA is a double helix. We can also see that the nitrogenous bases make up the inside rungs of the ladder. When we're looking at how DNA looks like a ladder, instead of having rungs like a ladder, it has nitrogenous bases that are matching up on the inside, okay? And remember what our rule is? A always binds with T and C always binds with G. And if we look inside here, there's a T, so what must be across from it? An A. There's a T, what must be across from it? An A, okay? There's a C, what must be across from it? A G, because those are the ones that bind together, and that's something that will never change. So it's very important that we know our binding rules, A with T, C with G. 
Now, before we go any further, we also need to mention the binding rules of RNA. So you should have written down under RNA that there are also four nitrogenous bases for it, adenine, cytosine, guanine, and uracil instead of thymine. And the rules are going to be very similar for RNA as far as binding is concerned. C will always bind with G as it did in DNA, but the difference lies in the A and the U. Okay, A will always bind with U when we're talking about RNA, and this is because there is no T. So we substitute U for T, so in RNA, A always binds with U, and C always binds with G. So this brings us to the main topic of chapter 10, which is something called transcription and translation. Now back in chapter 3, when we talked about protein, a few of the things that we talked about were that protein can be considered one of the most important uh, organic molecules in the body. I gave you some examples of what those important things um, that proteins do for the body. I told you that proteins make up muscle, okay, which also would include the heart um, and all the digestive organs, which are lined with muscle. It helps to make up your hair, your skin, your nails, the lens of your eye. It makes up hemoglobin, which carries oxygen throughout the blood. So there's definitely no way we could survive without proteins making up our body. They also help make up some of the structure of bone. So without protein, we would not be at all. So because the body is so dependent upon protein, we must be constantly making new protein. And so the process of transcription and translation is the story of how protein is created in the cells. And it's a two-step process. Transcription being the first part and translation being the second part. Transcription and translation happens of course, inside the cell, and the words of the DNA language are in what we call triplets or codons. So let's see what that means, okay? So we're going to start out by talking about transcription, and in order to do transcription, we must go into the cytoplasm of the cell. So remember that the, uh, or we must go into the nucleus, we're going to go into the nucleus first for transcription. Please be sure you note that. I was getting ahead of myself there. Translation takes place in the cytoplasm, okay? So what we're gonna do first, and we're gonna come back to this uh, commentary here, but we're gonna start first by looking at this picture, okay? So in this picture, this is kind of an overview showing what we are gonna be talking about in transcription and translation. Now, if I were to ask you to transcribe something, what do you think that means? Transcribing. Transcribing means we're going to copy something down. Okay, we're going to write something down. And that's exactly what we're going to do. So I would suggest you make a little uh, note about the steps of transcription. Transcription means to copy. Okay, so what we're going to do in transcription is we are going to go into the nucleus of the cell. Remember that the nucleus is where the DNA is kept. And the DNA is where we want to go because the DNA holds the instructions for how to make a protein. The DNA carries instructions for everything. It's the blueprint of who we are and the cell's activities. So in order to get instructions for anything, we have to go straight to the source, which is the nucleus. So we need to go into the nucleus of the cell and we need to copy down the instructions for how to make a protein. Okay, copy down the instructions for how to make a protein. So that's going to be step one, transcription. We're going to go into the nucleus and copy down the instructions for how to make the protein. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're first going to note um, one of the enzymes we're going to use to begin this process. So under transcription, I would also like you to note that we are going to use an enzyme called RNA 
polymerase. Okay, and I'm going to spell that for you. This is an enzyme that's going to help us to copy down the instructions for making a protein. RNA polymerase. We know how to spell RNA. Polymerase is P-O-L-Y, poly, M-E-R-A-S-E. P-O-L-Y, M-E-R-A-S-E. RNA polymerase, okay? So we, what was gonna happen is RNA polymerase, which is an enzyme, is going to go into the nucleus and it's going to copy down the instructions for making a protein, okay? Make sure you jot that down under transcription. It's gonna copy down the instructions for making a protein <clears throat> and it's gonna bring those instructions out of the nucleus, okay? Now, one thing that we also need to note, as well as using RNA polymerase as our enzyme, is we are going to copy down those instructions onto a strand of RNA. This is where we're going to use our first RNA. We're going to copy those instructions down onto a strand of RNA. RNA is, um, specifically in this particular instance, we're using a type of RNA called messenger RNA. Messenger. RNA and messenger RNA is written little m RNA little m RNA messenger RNA okay so I'm going to go forward here to this picture all right and what we're looking at here what I want you to focus on first and right now we don't know what any of this stuff is okay and that's okay because we haven't talked about it yet but this pink strand right here this is a messenger RNA okay and we know that because there's a little m RNA written out there for us, okay? Messenger RNA is created when we go into the nucleus with RNA polymerase, that enzyme we were talking about, goes into the nucleus and copies down the instructions for how to make a protein, okay? So this pink strand of messenger RNA holds the instructions for how to make a protein. It's all right here, all the instructions, okay? And the reason we call it messenger RNA is because it's carrying a message for us, carrying a message. So this messenger RNA is carrying the message for how to make a protein. So this messenger RNA is now going to go out into the cytoplasm, okay, and begin the second phase, which is called translation, translation, okay? So translation is the next step. So let's make a couple of notes about translation. Translation happens in the cytoplasm. It happens in the cytoplasm. And we are going to use the messenger RNA. That's what this is that we copied down instructions on. We're gonna use the messenger RNA. We're also going to use a ribosome. That's what this big brown thing is right here. This is a ribosome. The ribosome, remember we talked about in chapter four, talking about the cell, ribosomes make protein. And that's what we're trying to do. So it makes sense that a ribosome would be involved here. Okay, so we're gonna use a ribosome and we're also going to use what are called transfer RNAs, transfer RNAs. These little things here that look like candles, look like they have a little wick on them, a bent candle. Those are transfer RNAs, or tRNA, okay? So that's what we're doing in translation. We're using messenger RNA, ribosomes, and transfer RNA, and we're trying to make what? Protein, okay? All right, so we've got our messenger RNA, and the messenger RNA is gonna come out to the cytoplasm where it can be translated. This is our second step translation. And the words or the instructions of that messenger RNA are written in triplets or codons. Okay, and each one of those codons will actually um, <clears throat> specify specific amino acids that can be used to build a protein. So we're going to take a little bit closer look at that. Okay, so here we go. We're coming out into the cytoplasm. Here is our messenger RNA. Okay, here's our messenger RNA. 
And this messenger RNA, remember, has the instructions for how to make a protein. So we're going to go into translation. And translation, remember, happens in the cytoplasm. And we're going to use a ribosome, which is this big brown thing, and also what are called transfer RNAs. Now, if we look a little bit closer, there's something I want you to notice. There are a lot of these little shapes on the messenger RNA, but if we look closely, those shapes are grouped in threes. One, two, three, 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 and it continues on. So they're grouped in what are called triplets or codons. We call them triplets or codons. So here's an example right here. There's a codon. It's a group of three nitrogenous bases, three letters, A, U, and G, okay? three nitrogenous bases. And each one of those groups of three is called either a triplet or a codon. And each one of those triplets or codons will actually code for a specific amino acid. And remember, amino acids grouped together is what makes um, proteins, which is what we're trying to do in the first place, okay? So at the beginning of translation, what we're going to have is we're going to have the ribosome come in and it's going to kind of latch onto the messenger RNA strand sort of like a train sits on train tracks. And the first thing it's going to do is it's going to read the codon. Okay, so here's our codon here, A-U-G. Okay, so we read out the codon. Now remembering our binding rules, what binds with A when we're talking about RNA? What binds with A? A binds with U, remember, because there's no T in RNA. So A binds with U, U binds with A, and G binds with C. A binds with U, U binds with A, and G binds with C, okay? Now notice we have a transfer RNA here. It looks like a little bent candle, okay? And that transfer RNA is green, and it has on it three nitrogenous bases too, U, A, C. Those three nitrogenous bases on the bottom of this transfer RNA are called the anti-codon, or opposite of codon. This is our codon down here, and this is what we call an anti codon, anti-codon, okay? So the anti-codon is attached to the transfer RNA, and the transfer RNA also has on it, we have this little, looks, looks like a little candle wick, and on the tip of it, this is an amino acid, okay? That's an amino acid. Remember, amino acids joined together make proteins, okay? So each transfer RNA is carrying an amino acid with it, along with an anti-codon, which is the opposite of codon. So again, remembering our binding rules, AUG is our first codon, and A goes with U, U goes with A, and G goes with C. So these guys are a perfect match. They fit together beautifully. So AUG is read, okay, by the ribosome. The ribosome docks onto the messenger RNA strand, and it reads that first codon, AUG, and it calls out to the cytoplasm, hey, are there any transfer RNAs out there that match with AUG? And this transfer RNA just happens to match perfectly with it because it has the matching uh, nitrogenous bases that go with these three, UAC. So that transfer RNA will dock itself down onto that first codon and they'll bind together and the transfer RNA brought with it an amino acid, which we need because we're trying to make a protein, okay? So let's look at what happens after this. The messenger RNA will move a codon at a time relative to the ribosome. A transfer RNA will pair with each codon, adding an amino acid to the growing polypeptide, okay? So let's look at what that actually means in English, okay? And we're going to use this picture here, which remember again, this is in your textbook if you can't see it very well, okay? So we're going to start out where we left off, okay? So here's the ribosome, this brown thing. There's the ribosome. 
The pink strand is our messenger RNA, messenger RNA, okay? And the first codon, the first little group of three will be red and will call out to the cytoplasm. Is there any transfer RNA out there that will match with this codon, okay? Transfer RNA comes in and docks itself down, bringing with it an amino acid, okay? Then we're gonna read the next codon, the next little group of three, and we'll call out to the cytoplasm, is there any transfer RNA out there that matches with these three nitrogenous bases? So whichever transfer RNA matches will come in, bringing with it its amino acid, and it will dock itself down into position. So here we've got two transfer RNAs docked into position, okay? Each one of them carrying amino acids. Now the first transfer RNA that came in, the original, what he's gonna do is he's gonna hand off his amino acids to the new guy, okay? And the new guy will take on all those amino acids. We can see that's happened here, okay? And once the, the original transfer RNA gives its amino acids to the new guy, then he will leave because he's no longer needed anymore in this process. So the next thing that will happen, we've got this new guy and he has a trail of amino acids on him and the old guy left. Okay, we're gonna move the next step up here. So what's gonna happen is the messenger RNA and the ribosome are gonna move, okay? And we're going to click down the next step to read the next codon, okay? So the next codon we will read and call out to the cytoplasm. Is there anyone out there who matches this new codon? And the new transfer RNA will come in and dock itself down and then we'll pass off just like we see here the new guy will come in this keeps going in a circle the new guy will come in and we'll pass off those amino acids to the new guy okay which we can see happening here once the new guy takes on those amino acids then we will let the old guy leave and we'll move down to the next codon and we'll continue this process of reading each codon until we reach the end of the line, which is what we call the stop codon. And when we reach the end of the line, translation will be over and we will be left with this, which is a chain of amino acids. And if we have a chain of amino acids together, what do we call that? A protein, which is what we were trying to make this entire time. And notice up here where it says polypeptide. Polypeptide is just a fancy name for protein. It's the same it's the same thing, okay? So if you see polypeptide, you should not confuse it. Um, all it means is protein. So this process will continue in a cycle until we reach that stop codon. Once we reach the stop codon, then we will have what we came, what we came to get, which is a brand new protein. So the sequence of codons in DNA will spell out the primary structure of a polypeptide, which is why we use the DNA in the first place to get the instructions. Polypeptides form proteins that cells and organisms use to incorporate into the body. So this review shows that we got the instructions from the DNA, we made messenger RNA with it, and we used transfer and messenger RNA along with the ribosome to create a protein. This concludes chapter 10.